the Shark Tank. Got the agenda on here. We've got a couple of different sponsors, and I'm really interested to hear all these pitches. Um, so we'll have a great conversation about what is going on uh, with Bitcoin and the market. And uh, then we will move to those a little bit later in the show. So definitely, definitely stick around. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Um, man, I, I, I thought we were just bursting through to 100K here. I've got a gentleman's back with some friends here to at least hit 80K by the halving. And I thought maybe it was going to be 75K by the end of the day with Bitcoin. But we've, we've reverted back a little bit. You know, a, a nightmare 1% pullback. Uh, in the in the last couple hours here, but uh, Rock, I see you up on stage, bud. Long time no see. We got any thoughts on Bitcoin and what's going on right now? Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not big on short term uh, or even medium term price predictions. I think we hit. I think we probably hit. Uh, I've got some bets myself out there. Uh, I think I made a bet with. Uh, with AK, uh, he, he runs uh, a couple funds. I don't know if you guys, uh, maybe some people heard it on a, on one of our other spaces. But I think I, I think I bet that we hit. Uh, I think I was being conservative, one seventy five. But I mean, I, I think this thing can go to if any kind of white swan event happens, this thing could go to five hundred a million this cycle. Uh, I mean, my big. My big prediction is that BRICS will use Bitcoin uh, in the next couple of years. And if that happens, yeah, I mean, if countries start using Bitcoin to settle trade, if countries start using Bitcoin as, uh, you know, a, a store of value, uh, which I, I think there's, there's countries already stacking Bitcoin that just aren't telling anyone right now. The hash rate has been through the roof for the last year. And uh, I think there may be some nation states involved. Well, I love your heads up. And I, you know, it's funny we, we get on these things and everyone talks about the Brock Swan event that might take us uh, down. But I love I love to hear you know what if there's a white Swan event? I love that. And you know we go even higher than before. Uh, Jay's giving some hearts. Jay, you got any thoughts on on where we're headed? Hey Joe, how's it going? Hey, give me uh, let me know on the mic check here. We were hosting a space this morning. We had a hell of a time. Does it sound okay? Sound great. Yeah, good stuff. No, I'm excited uh, right now. You know, I joined the market, you know, a little bit earlier than the having of the last cycle, so it's kind of a nostalgic time for me. Um, how I'm thinking about things right now, I guess I think a little bit more conservatively, but basically from this point on, I think every coin is a meme coin. Uh, right now, it's all about narrative. It's all about social engagement. It's all about selling a story. And I was kind of reflecting that last cycle, you know, maybe five months from now, the YouTubers came out and started talking about fundamental analysis, you know, at prices that, I don't know, we're like 60 or 80% down from right now. So um, I think that's pretty funny. I'm just uh, trying to keep my head thinking about the bottom of the next bear and trying to increase the fundamental value of the projects I'm interested in for that time, when we get back to building. At the same time, I'm pretty excited about this uh, ballistic missile mission we're going to be going on in the next, I don't know, hopefully 12 months longer. I am uh, placing a few bets on projects I'm, you know, really close to, projects that I, I really believe in. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, trying to grow wealth and not trying to, to lose it all again. We'll hopefully get a little bit better luck this, this time around. Um, but yeah, you, you said two things in there that are kind of interesting, you know, like last cycle and, you know, we, when, you know, we all kind of, in the cycle before kind of coined this phrase like projects, which you said, which is, I feel like, you know, describes, you know, utility and tokens that are building utility. And then this time around, you know, it seems like everyone keeps just saying the word narratives and narratives, I feel like implies meme coins. Um, and that we're trying to, we're, we're struggling for a narrative for the rest of the market um, where Bitcoin is moving up in the spot ETF and it's very clear and concise what's happening there, inflows, outflows, it's something that people can calculate. Um, but, you know, it, it's all about narrative this time. And, you know, we've even got the uh, BRC20X up there, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but the narrative started early last year with ordinals on Bitcoin. 
And that was kind of like the meme coin community. And, and, and in a way, meme coin and NFTs kind of bursting out a year ago when people weren't talking about anything. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear you guys' thoughts about what, what is the other narrative that's happening outside of just Bitcoin that's going to lead us to that, you know, massive white swan and massive, you know, upswing here with the rest of the market outside of Bitcoin. Love to hear anyone that wants to hop in. I mean, the, the world's, the world's current financial system is what many would, uh, you know, say on the, on the brink of failure. Um, I mean, our debt is growing exponentially. I think only, you know, a month ago I was saying, you know, that, uh, the debt was growing at a hundred or it was growing at a trillion dollars every hundred days. Now we're at a trillion dollars every 90 days i mean what is uh, this this in what world is this sustainable in by any metric you look at historically for hundreds of years where where it looks like something is is on on the edge of just breaking collapsing uh, you know it's hard to say i don't you know there's a lot of uh doomsday talk i don't want to be you know like a peter schiff that's you know a broken clock is is right twice a day um but it does seem like i mean something's something's got to break and even if it doesn't just the fact that there's this chance of it breaking is bitcoin rocket fuel i mean we've got a, a pretty perfect setup here <clears throat> where you know you've got uh you know for example fed hasn't even cut rates yet uh people the, the institutional buy-in of bitcoin this time is incredibly incredibly high. Um, you've got a Bitcoin ETF that allows retail and institutional flows to flow in. And, you know, I think people are really sleeping on Bitcoin this cycle. You've got these monumental kind of uh, magnitude shifts for Bitcoin's price appreciation, like being, you know, incredibly bullish this cycle, like the ETF. No other crypto assets can have an ETF for a long time. People keep trying to meme the ETH one into existence. They're not going to do that. They're going to do that for at least a couple of years. Don't take my word for it. <clears throat> take the smartest people on the street who have evaluated the probability that an ETF will be approved, which are the Bloomberg uh, ETF analysts who previously called that the Bitcoin ETF would be approved by a certain date with a high degree of accuracy. They believe that the Ethereum ETF has a very low probability of being approved in the next few years. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure why you'd want an Ethereum ETF. That's a very fucking bearish thing for ETH. ETH is proof of stake. <laughs> why would you want? Why would you want all of that capital accumulated into that ETF? Because then that ETF is going to have an overly. But what happens if the ETF gets slashed? Are you just going to let that all get slashed, or are you going to roll back the chain? And we've seen in previous uh, historical cycles, you know, ETH has chosen to roll back the chain. Now they claim that today they wouldn't do that. And by the way, I think Ethereum is a really interesting project. I'm not trying to just pick on Ethereum here, but um, Bitcoin, what I'm trying to say here is that Bitcoin and singularly Bitcoin will have ETF flows, which is basically the liquidity of the world is now tapped into Bitcoin, whereas before people had to wire money to Coinbase and get signed up and it took weeks to do. They're going to be able to do this instantly in their, in their brokerage account. So that's going to be a massive um, tailwind for Bitcoin, where I don't think we're going to see it perform like everyone's expecting to perform, which is a degraded performance where it might just 2x or something like that. Now, I think Bitcoin is going to, it might return back to its previous cycle returns where we've never seen this amount of capital, uh, you know, plugged into Bitcoin where it can buy Bitcoin. And then at the same time, too, <coughs> you've got really exciting things like Bitcoin DeFi. The explosion of Bitcoin L2s, the explosion of dApps on top of Bitcoin Bitcoin is taking back market share from other crypto crypto assets. Where yeah, Bitcoin isn't a great smart contract platform on layer one, but the L2 is allowed to do as many things as you could possibly want to do with your Bitcoin. So I think when we look at Bitcoin DeFi, this is kind of a dark horse where like not a lot of people thought about this. But if this becomes true, this changes everything about Bitcoin's market share within crypto. Um, you know, here's a good example. On some days, there's more trading volume in Bitcoin NFTs than Ethereum NFTs. And that's under a year that happened. Ordinals just started about January 2023. So to see Bitcoin take over an entire in a subsector like that in a year with like really shitty UX and a clunky experience, 
I don't think people are ready for what happens with Bitcoin DeFi this summer, or not this summer, but uh, Bitcoin DeFi in general. Um, and then also that plus like ETF flows. I think I think we'll see an incredibly uh, interesting and like uh, an outperforming cycle based on what people are expecting. Yeah, I gotta say, I think that the biggest use case for this technology still remains finance, and Bitcoin's a clear, clear winner. Other uh, areas of finance that I think are going to pick up steam this cycle and uh, for the years after, definitely tokenizing everything, real-world assets. I'm a little curious to see how that goes, right? Are we going to go into, like, basically private databases, private ledgers, you know, BlackRock tokenize everything? Or are we going to have, like, truly uncensorable, unstoppable um, records of where these digital assets are over the world? I'm a little bit bearish on... DeFi, uh, Bitcoin L2s, I'm really bearish on inscriptions, not as a narrative, not as like a, a meme, but as like a technology. I think there's a lot of centralization shortcuts that you have to do to make it there. Inscriptions, for instance, you need a lot of centralized uh, indexers to uh, even see where these assets are. They're just like attestations of meanings to, to red mashes. But um, still, I think finance is really strong. Real world assets is really strong. And then the other one I think is going to come to fruition this cycle is is gaming um not in a piddly shit way but in the big gaming houses really starting to explore i think if you're paying attention you're seeing that happening in a few places dan mentioned eth etfs being potentially bearish i think this is an important topic that we need to to consider you know some people were worried that bitcoin etfs could be uh, an issue for Bitcoin. I mean, if you're worried that ETFs are an issue for Bitcoin centralization or co-opting of the network, then you should be very worried about Ethereum ETFs. And, you know, I'll preface this with I'm a, ma a huge Bitcoiner. Uh, I, I think I coined the phrase around seven years ago, Bitcoin maximal-ish, but I love Ethereum. A lot of my life's wealth is in Ethereum and Polygon. I, I co-founded QuickSwap, one of the largest DEXs in the world, and I, I build a lot of things on Ethereum. But I am pretty concerned about this ETF uh, stuff. And just generally, when ETH moved to proof of stake, the network can be guided, influenced, co-opted by a variety of factors, either charismatic leaders. You know, Ethereum is very malleable. And that's a concern when, it, when it's going to hold the world's smart contracts. Bitcoin ETF right now is already up to 5% of all Bitcoin is in ETFs. And it just started. If ETH uh, had, say, 5% within the first couple months, I mean, if ETH gets to, I don't remember the number, it's not 51%. Like Bitcoin, I think maybe it's 30-something percent, they say, with proof of stake that you can start to have issues if, if a bad actor had 30-something percent of the supply. So if you start getting these ETFs and they're, you know, these are United States companies and you have government, you know, influence them to start affecting the network, whether that's censoring things like Tornado Cash, which we saw previously, uh, or even just change the network in a way that, makes more sense for these institutions or maybe makes more sense for the government. These are possibilities and I'm, I'm not trying to FUD ETH. I love ETH. It's amazing. I'm glad, uh, you know, you guys both mentioned, uh, uh, Dan and Jay both mentioned Bitcoin L2s and I think bringing ETH to, you know, level smart contracts to Bitcoin is incredible. Uh, I'm really excited about that space. But uh, this is a concern what Dan brought up. Yeah, you've got, you know, I think you've got some really smart people, you know, that are taking a pretty intelligent look and can poke, you know, it's not like poking holes per se, but I just, you know, saying it's a little malleable. And I think it also has to fit from a retail perspective. Like th these things have to fit. And with Bitcoin as an ETF, the point of Bitcoin for a lot of people is to just to hold it, right? It's a, it's a store of value. And with Ethereum, I mean, it's gas. It's supposed to be used on the blockchain. And so if it's sitting there in someone's, 401k, like they're not using it as gas, they're not building dApps, it's not an ecosystem play. So it just doesn't feel in, in, in natural, and I think some things have to feel natural. Alex, go ahead.
just a frozen hand up in the air. Ryan, you've been a little quiet. You got any uh, any comments on how you're feeling about the, the market? And maybe you could even talk a little bit about, you know, today. I, I haven't, I've been on spaces and product meetings all morning, and I woke up in Bitcoin. I thought we were going to 75K, and now we're sitting here at 68. So I didn't even see what happened unless it's just a standard GBTC outflow. I think it was just on the back of um, the announcement that the judge was going to allow the SEC suit to proceed against Coinbase, just taking a little win window to the sales um, after that, like, initial spike. Um, but, you know, it's all relative. Like, we're down, like, a percent and a half from, you know, yesterday. Um, uh, the, just a thought on the on the Ether ETF discussion. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people are concerned about how this, you know, decentralized censorship-resistant technology could almost become a victim of its own success as a financial asset and become sort of centralized and, and co-opted. I, I would say that, like, I think that the demand for ETH, I could be wrong, but I think the demand for ETH from, like, self-directed retail, TradFi investors, advisors, and so forth is probably a lot more modest than it is for Bitcoin. Um, you know, I don't know what that number looks like, but it's going to be a fraction of, of the same amount. And we have some experience with this with, uh, you know, like the Grayscale Ethereum Trust, the difference in, in AUM versus um, versus Bitcoin, and also in Canada, the Ethereum ETFs. And But at the same time, I also think that, like, the market's much thinner and, and the impact on price would be really significant. And, and like, I, I just, you know, sometimes I, I think you shouldn't overthink it. Like, if Ethereum gets an ETF and everyone starts, and you get even, like, $2 billion versus, you know, 12 of net flows, which is what we've seen for Bitcoin so far, that's going to have a huge impact on the price, which is going to drive the value of the asset class higher. And, you know, it's reflexive, right? The higher, the more valuable ETH is, the more... Um, you know, the more TVO grows and the more, uh, in, you know, activity on the network and on the L2s and so forth. And so, like, I think it's just, it's going to be a positive. Um, you know, concentration question would be, um, it's still such a hypothetical. I, it's not something I worry about imminently, basically. Yeah, I, I tend to think that the Ethereum ETS will see a lot less interest than Bitcoin ETS if they're approved in the next, yeah. you know, two two months if they're approved in May. It's just, I spend a lot of time uh, at, at Bitwise out on the road talking to advisors and institutions and, and RAs about crypto in general. Uh, and I would say 99% or maybe 98% of those conversations are centered around Bitcoin. And that's not just, you know, us pushing the Bitcoin narrative. It's really where we see most of our questions and where we see most of the interest today. And part of that is obviously because Bitcoin ETFs are, are top of mind and front and center right now. But it was also this way a year ago, two years ago. It's just something that a lot of institutional investors are focused on, and Ethereum is something they're not focused on. I think part of it's a learning a learning curve. Honestly, they spend a very small amount of their time thinking about crypto. Uh, they're they're thinking about bonds and stocks and growing their AUM and uh, you know going going to the golf course and, and taking clients out to dinner and things like that. And they're not really sitting on Twitter or. Uh, you know, even on their Bloomberg terminals, looking up crypto research or thinking about crypto. And so because of that, I, I agree that, you know, Ethereum is a smaller market in general, obviously. And so uh, an ETF could have a positive impact on the price if it wasn't as large as Bitcoin ETFs. But I do think the overall demand for Ethereum ETFs in this next two months would be lower than what we've seen for Bitcoin ETFs. Now, maybe a year or two years from now, if Bitcoin ETFs, continue to grow, which I think they will. And then we saw Ethereum ETFs launch. I think it could be a different story. It would give the asset class more time to mature. It would allow investors to become you know, more normalized to the concept of crypto being in the mainstream and starting to understand that there's assets out there other than Bitcoin. But right now, they're so hyper-focused on Bitcoin as the only thing they're thinking about when it comes to crypto and then trying to introduce Ethereum as another concept or any other crypto asset, whether it's Solana or even NFTs, or even DeFi, it really does kind of um, just like not go over their head, but you can see their eyes kind of gloss over when you start talking about it, and I think they start thinking about some other things. And so, um, you know, I think, that being said, I think Bitcoin ETFs are a very strong tailwind for the market that could continue through the end of the year. I think we're very early in majority of allocations that we're seeing to Bitcoin ETFs, and obviously that demand combined with the uh, falling supply post having following new supply post having created a really interesting dynamic for the market and so i'm still still you know fairly optimistic on where we can go from here but 
I do think that it will be a largely Bitcoin centered movement for the rest of this year, at least. Yeah, one, one comment just on that. Like, I, I agree in terms of the flows. I'm so curious if we have any, um, you know, experts on the process in, in the U.S. Because, like, the best analysts on this have been the Bloomberg analysts. And their opinion is basically the lack of chatter, um, the lack of back and forth between issuers and the regulators is a sign that it's likely going to get delayed. The, the, the final filing for the two which are eligible, uh, which is May 23rd. And so like May 23rd will all in all likelihood be a delay date for an ETH ETF. But I did see an interesting analysis from the, um, I think it was the chief legal officer of Grayscale that basically said, well, it's true that during the Bitcoin process, there was a lot of back and forth, but don't take silence now as a sign that it's, you know, uh, dead in the water because a lot of the questions that they had in the fall of last year about Bitcoin, about like custody and trading and settlement and so forth, apply to Ether. And so therefore, like all the th questions that they had then would be the questions that they have now. So like the fact that there's some quiet, um, you know, here is not a sign that they're not engaging. Maybe it's just a sign that a lot of their questions are asked. Personally, I feel that that's a little optimistic. Um, to be honest, based on, you know, some of the news that we've seen out of out of the regulator in the US, but it was an interesting zag to the zig. And I think the consensus is basically like there's a 0% probability of an approval on the May 23rd deadline. I don't know if anybody here disagrees or has a, a view on on those two, two perspectives, because I do think that um, the, the, you know, the other one is sort of worth thinking about a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, I can't speak to any in particular filing uh, for for compliance reasons, but generally speaking, I think that um, we've seen in our experience and generally across the experience of launching Bitcoin ETFs for all issuers, there was quite a bit of engagement from the SEC in the months leading up to the launch. So they launched in January, uh, on January 11th, but uh, at least two months, but probably closer to three months before that, there was a lot of engagement. And you saw that through public announcements of meetings that were happening with the SEC or uh, questions being sent back to issuers and then refiling of, of forms with the SEC. And I, we just haven't seen that level of engagement across the different issuers that have filings out there from the SEC. So to your point, uh, you know, that's the reason why the Bloomberg ETF analysts like Belchunas and, and Safer are, are putting the odds. I think I saw earlier this week at 25% of approval, whereas I would say at this point in the last, now this, if you were to like throw the time on Bitcoin ETFs over where we're at right now with Ethereum ETFs, we were anywhere between 75% to 90% likelihood of approval from the same, uh, the same ETF analysts at that point in time for Bitcoin. So it's certainly a very different outlook from their perspective. Now, they're experts in the space, but they aren't the ones engaging with the SEC directly, right? They're just kind of reading the tea leaves. So I think that's worth noting, and they certainly could could be wrong, and they're likely taking conservative approach. However, they were obviously uh, right on the spot when it came to to Bitcoin ETFs. They they got that one correctly. Is it is it a situation where a lot of the questions are answered? Maybe a lot of the same questions apply to Ethereum as they do to Bitcoin when it comes to spot ETFs. They're looking yeah. at, can they surveil the market? How does the CME futures market impact the spot market? Uh, is there the ability for the market to be manipulated? How does custody work? Those are a lot of the same questions, undoubtedly. And so I do think that we are in a world where some of that's already been answered, but given that we're, call it 45 days out or something from when those, uh, those final decisions have to be made, I, my guess, is that we would be seeing more more engagement but again that's it's really it could be happening behind the scenes that we're not seeing or to your point it could just be happening less because we've already gone through those motions um and and i guess only only time will tell but then the way this this process works right is if there are is a rejection uh there there could be just additional filings that happen after that and that kind of restarts this 240 day window uh, where the SEC can kind of review and kick the can down the road further. Or we could see a firm like Grayscale, as they did in the past, get, go to courts against the SEC. And I don't think the SEC wants that. It wasn't a positive outcome for them when it came to Bitcoin ETFs. But there's also a little bit of a, hey, the court's saying we have to do this, so we're going to do it if that does happen, which I think takes a little bit of the culpability or like public perception risk off the SEC if something goes wrong. Not that I think it would go wrong, but if you know the crypto market crashes, investors get burned, 
it's seeking back, hey, look, we, we didn't want to do this, but we were forced to do it. And so maybe that's the route they're going to take, but it also creates some public perception. Hey, um, hey Ryan, like, yeah. get into that a little bit. You know, like you said, crypto market crashes. You know, it seems like everyone up here, you know, even if you are bullish, which it sounds like a lot of people are, um, you know, the ETF is out there. That ship has sailed, right? We have inflows. Alex, I'm going to mute you real quick, but if you can mute your mic while you're not speaking. But, um, so ETF is there, ship has sailed, inflows potentially, you know, for years to come. Um, you know, VC funding has moved up. Some bigger rounds are being done in the last, you know, 60 days specifically. You've got the halving coming up. You know, it's a psychological um, standpoint that has had market dynamics. You know, I think 900 Bitcoins come on the market every day. You know, we've got 800 million less in selling pressure, um, you know, every month, whatever else it may be. And then you have the Fed getting dovish, and like we were saying, rates potentially coming down. Where's that money market? Where are those money market funds going to go? They're going to come flushing back into the market. It's like, you know, it, it seems like the perfect scenario, but I'd love, you know, for anyone to kind of steer man like a bearish case here. Um, you know, is there, is there like, what, what pulls us out of all of these, these forces kind of moving forward? Hey, Joe, by the way, you're, you sound a little bit muffly. I don't know if you're, uh, want to talk into your phone more, or, uh, change your, your headset or something, but slightly muffly, not, not too bad, but I think it's my long hair getting in the way of these, uh, air, this, uh, AirPods Max. <laughs> Look, I, I think that's right. I think it's hard to be bearish at this point in time. Uh, there are a lot of potential tailwinds out there. First and foremost, the large demand that we're continuing to see week in and week out of spot Bitcoin ETFs and the the outflows from the various sales of GBTC have continued to, to dampen that momentum uh, here and there. But largely speaking, we've clearly seen there be demand. And, and I know in the the conversations that I'm having, like just was it was it last week, it might have been the week before last week. I'm starting to lose track of time on this, but I was I was on the road talking to a bunch of RAAs and I was surprised that they are still at the stage where they're not really considering Bitcoin as an investment. And that, that kind of reminded me just how early we all are in this process is that you have these large family offices and uh, private equity firms and, uh, and, and money managers who just are shrugging Bitcoin off as an investment. They still, after we have ETFs, after they're some of the most successful ETF launches of all time, after you have Larry Fink out there on CNBC and Fox Business News talking about Bitcoin as a fight to quality asset and adding Bitcoin into model portfolios for both BlackRock and Fidelity, we're still seeing a ton of money managers who control trillions of dollars of wealth in the U.S. shrug Bitcoin off. And they were quite literally using the terms, you know, tulip mania and Ponzi scheme, which to me was mind blowing that we're still having those conversations. But it was also somewhat refreshing in the sense of, we're really so early in this cycle and not just this cycle, but the broader adoption of Bitcoin as 1% or 3% or 5% in a traditional portfolio. So there's early adopters that are already here and that are allocating, but majority of the investment public, I still think isn't taking Bitcoin serious. And so when you have those other tailwinds, like the potential for interest rates to drop and, and, uh, you know, the potential for more regulatory clarity in the U.S. You see the U.K. getting more friendly towards Bitcoin with the off and crypto in general with the offering of uh, exchange trade notes on Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's just so many positive tailwinds coming into this space that unless we have another black swan moment, you know, and, and I obviously don't think this is going to happen. But it, say if we had a, a, an FTX like moment with a Coinbase, uh, which, again, I don't think is possible or is 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 likely at all but you know that could create a dark mark on the industry that sets us back but short of something like that i find it hard to uh hard to forecast a, a space out here where the market does actually crash uh you know interest rates start to turn upwards again maybe we see a pullback in markets that's rather rather significant but without a rapid shock in interest rate policy to the upside uh, of interest rates being uh risen i don't see a world where we don't continue this positive momentum uh, and climb to new highs. Yeah, really like what you brought up there, Ryan, about uh, you know existing financial advisors still aren't really pushing Bitcoin to their clients. Um, you know, I think like 
in the you know if you include Bitcoin in your portfolio, even just like one percent, it dramatically improves your Sharpe ratio. And you know now these financial advisors have an incentive, and they've got a, a thumbs up to add Bitcoin to a portfolio. And I think the numbers don't lie. And, and they're looking at modern portfolio theory when constructing these portfolios, and they're going to look at diversification and how this improves their Sharpe ratio. And it's a no brainer. I mean, th this will be a de facto allocation to all portfolios over time. Uh, right now, you know, there's still a lot of hesitation on the, on the, you know, on that front in terms of these financial advisors not getting the green light from their individual companies that they work at. But that will change over time, especially as they're incentivized with performance. Um, you know, I, I love a saying that goes, uh, "Their ignorance is our alpha." I mean, that fucking boomer on Vanguard. <laughs> The fucking Vanguard, I don't know what his role was, but I've never seen something that's made me more bullish than seeing that old fuck talk about how, because of volatility, that they won't allow their customers to buy Bitcoin. Who's the CEO, I think? Who's the CEO? I could, that is borderline negligence. Like, he should be removed. Well, he's no longer CEO. Oh, okay. As of, like, a week later. So. Oh, really? <laughs> a month yeah, later, he, yeah. You complain about volatility... Well, how do you feel about early stage startups? Like, I don't know, Apple, Google, some of those valuable companies in the world. Those are quite volatile. They're not these nice, there's not a nice linear price appreciation and, and perfect compensation for risk. Risk ex exists everywhere. And the fact that they had that stance, I was like, wow, my, my investment in Bitcoin isn't large enough. Like, <laughs> we, we are not nearly bullish enough because of these absolutely asinine takes by existing institutional folks. I'm happy for them to buy a Bitcoin from me someday at a million dollars. Um, you know, maybe their kids can go clean my, uh, clean my lawn. Uh, you know, but <laughs> it's, I, you know, it, it's moments like these where you, you're like, you know, was, was I that intelligent when entering this bet or is the world just really fucking stupid? And conservative, and that's where seeing him on stage was one of the most bullish things I've ever seen in my life. We've been saying, you know, I've been in Bitcoin since 2015, and I don't know when we started saying it, but I think maybe in like 16 or 17, I think the narrative was born of just one percent of your portfolio, uh, or that institutions should just have just one percent, as Dan mentioned. I mean, yeah, it, when you look at the the performance for, I mean, 15 years. We've got a decent track record going here. And if you just put 1%, you're never going to get castrated for, you know, oops, Bitcoin crashed. Oh, well, I, you know, you put 1% of your clients' funds into it. And we are now officially seeing this. Fidelity, in three of their funds, they have their, their all-in-one ETF, now, I think this is just in Canada. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think this is in the U.S. yet. But regardless, Canada is kind of the testing ground for sometimes for U.S. Uh, more uh, uh, aggressive, like financial things. Uh, you know, they got the ETF before us. Um, but yeah, one person. So in, they have their they're all in one fund and there's three versions of it. One is uh, more conservative. One's like in the middle and one is more aggressive. And it's one percent of the portfolio. And this is the all-in-one ETF. This has everything from, you know, S&P 500. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't know all the, the assets, but I'm assuming there's some bonds in there and, and maybe some money market stuff. I, I don't know. But whatever is all in it, it's 1% Bitcoin, 2% Bitcoin, or 3% Bitcoin, depending on your, your uh, level of aggression. I mean, so this is happening, guys. We're going to see this uh, across the world. I think we're going to see it with countries. We're going to see it with businesses. This will be, you know, just this will just be a natural way you store some of your assets. Yeah, no, really good, Rock. And, you know, I think a, a really interesting part of this is, you know, once you kind of go down the rabbit hole, you, you, ne you don't really, like, come back. You never, like, learn how Bitcoin works and then really think, like, oh, this is a bad thing. And, like, I didn't, I definitely didn't have, like, Larry Fink going full like degen tokenization on my bingo card. Like I thought it would happen slowly, um, but you know, he's understanding <laughs> what the world looks like and the difference between someone like that and someone like the CEO, you know, of Va like Vanguard, like you said, like the, those two businesses can go completely different ways. It's kind of like how 
Apple's just like skipping AI right now while everyone else is running and they're going to potentially have to buy something that's not native. Like these are two completely different um, directions in the, in the road that diverges in a wood here. So amazing well, stuff. And yeah, go ahead, Rob. Well, this is why this asset is still volatile and why it still has so much upside. When you have half of the world's smartest, greatest, legendary investors like Charles Munger, uh, like uh, Warren Buffett, calling it the worst thing and poison and you know rat poison squared, <clears throat> and then you have the other half of the world's greatest investors uh, saying that you know Larry Fink now and even people like uh, Jay Clayton, former uh, head of the SEC, who was a real hawk to us, now embracing it as he's out of office. Oddly, uh, seems to happen that way. Gensler also big. Big Bitcoin fan, big crypto fan, and then goes into office and becomes a, a hawk. And then when he leaves, he'll be back on it. He'll be working at some crypto company. Uh, but when you have half of the world's greatest investors saying it's the best thing ever and it's going to revolutionize the entire world and eat, eat all of finance, and then you have half saying it's the worst thing ever, you're going to have a lot of volatility, but it shows we still have a lot, lot of upside to go. Amazing. All right, guys, we're going to start to move into some of the pitch section here. We got Masa up on stage. Masa, you know, you got 10 minutes, you know, I would say, you know, give your, give it a little elevator pitch here. And then we've got some amazing speakers that have, you know, built businesses, work for huge brands um, that'll, that'll kind of ping you with some really good questions that you might get a lot of good feedback out of. So I'd say keep the pitch uh, short and then uh, we'll, we'll, you know, pepper you with some good questions here. We'll keep it cordial, um, but we'll definitely challenge. So um, Masa, you've got the stage. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. And I really enjoy the panel today. My name is Clenthia. I'm a co-founder at Masa. So what we do at Masa is that we are building the world's personal data network where users can own their data, share their data, and earn from their data to train AI on the Masa network. As we all know, in the data and AI era, data has become truly the world's most valuable commodity. And the biggest and the most valuable source of this data comes from you and me serving the internet, engaging on social platforms, and just simply living our digital lives. However, again, as we all know for too long, big tech companies have been exploiting our data. The rise of AI is only making it worse. That's the reason why at Masa, we believe that one of the biggest alpha in this wave of decentralized AI is in the data layer, giving you, users, a direct way to monetize your personal data and to participate in this AI boom. Um, we've been building Masa for the past two years. I'm super excited to share that we're actually going live with the Masa mainnet and Masa token in just two weeks on April 11th. So far, we have over 1.3 unique, uh, 1.3 million unique users who contributed their personal data to Masa, over 47,000 testnet node operators, and 70 developers who are building applications, training AI models using our Masa network data. Last year, we won the number one spot in the Binance MVB Accelerator. 20 days ago, we had a record-breaking 17-minute coinless community sale, raising over $8.75 million. We're super excited to be here today and to be the leading data network powering decentralized AI. Masa, well done. Good to, good to see you. I know you guys are uh, working with quick swap i don't know all the data we're using you for but is someone do you guys set this up because last week when i was on it was uh orion was the lumia uh, now rebranded as lumia was a sponsor and they're built on quick swap now masa is a partner of quick swap is someone is this uh planned or is this just random <laughs> well quick swaps ecosystem is so big now any new pitch will be building with quick swap no surprise there but yes quick swap is one of our um, most valuable partners in our ecosystem. So thank you for your business. I appreciate that. I don't know what we're doing, but I know what my team talks about you guys. Uh, you know, I hear about you regularly, maybe once a week. So I, we must be appreciating the data. Maybe you can tell me, I just pinged my team to see what, what exactly we're, what data we're getting from you guys. But uh, maybe you can tell us a little about the data you're giving us, unless it's something that our competitors don't know about, then don't, don't, talk about it <laughs> but but if it's something uh yeah maybe maybe you can uh share what you guys are doing with us yeah so in fact quick swap is one of the first customers of our data network 
So exactly how we're supporting QuickSwap and your tremendous growth, right? Uh, QuickSwap has a lot of users, does a lot of marketing campaign, and has a lot of exciting trading competitions. At Masa, we're able to help um, projects like QuickSwap make, so uh, make sense of your ecosystem. For example, when you're running a marketing campaign, I can tell you exactly what is the full funnel conversion, meaning that how many people engage with your content, of which how many people connected their wallet, how many people eventually converted, and how many people you get to retain in your ecosystem. So in no matter bull market or bear market, we always want to make data-driven decision, right? And Masa is basically your data best friend when it comes to intelligent growth of your ecosystem. Can you can you walk through a little bit how an, like an actual user, like you said, like users can monetize their data now? Like how is the actual user themselves versus like the B2B play? What's the retail person doing? Um, are, you, are they monetizing like their social accounts or their wallet? Like how do they get money? Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that people care the most about. As a user, how do you participate in the AI boom, right? Um, if we think about it, this generation of generative AI is really consuming a lot of data, scraping the public web, scraping social media, etc. And as user, you don't get to benefit from it currently. The idea with Masa is that as individual user and data owner, you'll be able to own your data, share your data, and monetize your data when AI developers use your data to train their AI model. So exactly how that happens. We want to make it super simple for uh, users. We don't want to have you like do 10 different kinds of actions before you contribute your data. There are currently a few ways that you can share data with a Masa network. First of all, it's really simple. Uh, you can either use our Masa application or Masa Chrome browser extension. Just participating quests, participating trading competition, serve the internet per usual. In the background, we're quietly, safely, and securely collecting your data and store it in your personal data locker, what we invented, a zero-knowledge SOBOUND token, to make sure that we're able to collect all of your digital footprint. And then on the other side, we have a data marketplace where developers like QuickSwap, but also Polygon, ZKSync, Avalanche, and many others can make requests, requesting specific types of data for a specific duration from users like yourself. That way, we're essentially building a two-sided marketplace of data supply from users and data demand from developers. Hopefully, that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. So you need the extension. Not necessarily. So extension, Masa app, or simply just living your additional life in the Masa ecosystem. Okay, so to be clear, all this data is coming from inside the Masa ecosystem? Because I don't know what word you used, but I thought you said uh, a bunch of users have uploaded or shared their data. So I'm kind of wondering where this data comes from and how we can be sure it's a unique set of data that's truly owned by the user and not just uh, you know available to be scraped in, from other parts of the web. Yeah, sure. So let's say if you come to the Masa app, right, and then you see different kind of community quests, you're able to participate in specific quests. Let's say contribute your wallet information to participate in this trading competition or connect your Twitter to permission your Twitter data to this specific community, etc. We basically collect all of this data in the Masa network and tie it to a unique zero knowledge Sobon token. Think of it as your personal data locker, right? So that way we're getting direct permission from the users and then tie that back to the user's data locker instead of just scraping the internet and then um, indexing public blockchain data out there. This sounds like you guys can uh, be on any blockchain. Do you guys have plans for that, like cross-chain? Yeah, Someone absolutely. Uh, so we are actually already supporting eight different mainnets. We're on Ethereum, we're on Polygon, BNB, OPBNB, Avalanche, Salo, Scroll, um, Base, and we're expanding to all EVM-compatible uh, compatible chains later this year, as well as getting into the non-EVM world. Um, the idea is really that no matter where the users are active, right, whether it's Solana or um, Sway or Ethereum, we want to help them control their own data. So cross-chain is definitely the future. 
so that's like the end game basically is the wallets they'll be connecting like 10 different wallets or whatever addresses and all that data across all these chains will be collected and I guess you could do a lot of things with that. That's very interesting, actually. Yeah, one hundred percent. So our goal—it sounds ambitious right now, but maybe we'll break it uh, in twelve months. Our goal is that in three years we want to be able to cover more than fifty percent of all user data in Web three. That definitely requires us to be everywhere, right?、Um, no matter how you are currently using the blockchain, whether it's using a wallet, using Chrome extension to browse the internet. We're using specific DApp. We want to be embedded as part of your digital life as you participate in Web three, so that we can collect the data, help you monetize the data. I'll, I'll share. Maybe this is like,、uh, you know, whatever. If our competitors are listening, but so my team has been、uh, telling me some of the stuff we're doing with you guys. Yes,、yeah, definitely some interesting stuff. And my team,、uh, the QuickSwap team, seems to be. Uh, like I'm reading here, you know, one message from them. Moss is great, very supportive of QuickSwap. We have a good relationship with them.、Uh, generally, sounds like they're, they're they're pretty happy. There's a bunch of other messages I won't read, but yeah, like one of the things that's kind of interesting is being able to kind of、uh, hmm, I don't want to give too much away, but target certain types of wallets. You know, with QuickSwap, we're always trying to optimize.、Uh, Optimize the exchange in in special ways so that we can be more competitive with with volume, and、uh, yeah. So there's there's some interesting things there.、Um, I'm assuming now that QuickSwap is using you guys, you probably we have this this kind of thing called the QuickSwap effect, where when we work with partners like El, you'll you'll probably have twenty or thirty other like medium size small dexes.、Uh, That will will copy the strategies, and, and that's all right.、Uh, it's good for the whole industry to benefit. There is some stuff we wanted you guys to do that I guess you weren't able to, and I, I won't talk about that here. But maybe you guys are going to be able to do that in the near future. But、uh, generally, yeah, team seems to be happy with you guys. This is not paid. I didn't even know Masa would be here. I'm not shilling for them. I have no vested interest. But well, it's, it's always great. An honest review. Yeah, it's always great when you know that is serendipitous, but that a customer can be on stage to to validate. So. Um, you know, thanks, thanks for the pitch there.、Uh, where can people find you? Where do you want to send people before we move on to、uh, BRC twenty X? Yeah, so please, please click on Masa.、Uh, follow us on Twitter. Again, we're going live with our mainnet and the Masa token in just two weeks. So a lot of exciting development coming up. When you said mainnet, so you guys are going to have a a chain? Is this?、Uh, I'm going to take a. So it's either an L one or it's an L two. Is it? Which way are you going? So we're actually building a dedicated Masa blockchain on an Avalanche subnet. So think of it as a data chain, right?、Uh, we'll be able to process data at scale through our Avalanche subnet with very low cost and、uh, huge scalability. What was what was the reason for choosing Avalanche? I mean, I my kind of it, investment thesis for the crypto industry, which has been a little altered recently, but、uh, is Bitcoin world. Asset settlement layer with functional layers on top, like Lightning and Liquid, and all the new Bitcoin L twos, and then Ethereum smart contract settlement layer with functional layers on top, like Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, zk Sync, Mantle, Linea, Scroll, etc. So why get away from being able to be plugged into that massive ecosystem? Avalanche is an island on its own. They're doing cool stuff, but why choose Avalanche? Maybe they walked off. <laughs> All good. Oh, sorry, I was talking to myself behind the mute button. Yeah, <laughs> so、good. just wanted to clarify one thing, right?、Um, even after we go live with Avalanche subnet, we're still able to support all the mainnet. So data can flow in from any chain, be that、um, Ethereum, Polygon, BNB, anywhere,、um, as long as we support the blockchain. Currently, we support eight of them, and we're going to expand into more blockchains down the road. However, the Avalanche sub subnet is really just for the processing of data, right? We compared Avalanche、uh, against a few competitors, which I guess I shall not name on this public spaces, and found Avalanche to be extremely easy to work with, highly scalable. We can set、uh, customized gas as well. Think about it: when you're processing billions of data points, you want to make sure that the gas structure is very optimal and very customizable. That's the reason why we we eventually chose Avalanche. So it's a performance thing. Interesting. I wonder if when you did that analysis, 
because I, I just look, I'm a big ETH fan. I think there's a lot of benefits, um, you know, not not bad mouthing Avalanche at all. But, you know, uh, Optimism's uh, super chains uh, have custom gas already. Uh, Polygon CDK just came out with custom gas token. And uh, with now Dencoon and some other upgrades to some of these these ETH L2s. I mean, they're they're very highly performant now. Uh, I wonder if it's uh, yeah. Anyways, if you want to talk about this offline, we can. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, Rock, take it take it to the Telegram channels. This is great, though. Um, really good to hear kind of the back and forth as well. Uh, BRC twenty X, are you there? Hey, what's going on, guys? Can you hear me? We can, we can. All right, you're you're up. Ten minutes. Um, awesome. Begins it's, now. All right. Well, really appreciated the talk so far today. Um, BRC20X, we see the huge potential in the new Bitcoin ordinals BRC20 narrative, and you guys kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. And if the narrative gets driven, then we're going to see these BRC20s just explode with Bitcoin. And so we're introducing a suite of easy-to-use utilities to the BRC20 ecosystem. And we've been live since January with a couple flagship products. So our goal is really to provide secure and simple tools so any user of crypto can start to leverage the growth of the Bitcoin blockchain beyond just BTC itself. So with the advent of ordinals and BRC20 tokens on Bitcoin, it's just really opened the doors for expansion on the world's most well-known blockchain. And yet... The problem is, in only about the year that ordinals have been functioning, development has been relatively slow, and everyday users are having a hard time understanding how to use BRC20s and how they fit into the overall crypto world. And so BRC20X is recognizing the importance of getting to and from unrelated blockchains, and specifically I'm talking about getting from EVM chains to BRC20s. And so we're providing resources to get from some of the top blockchains to the Bitcoin chain and directly into some of these emerging BRC20 tokens. And so our bridge uses native tokens like BTC, ETH, SOL, BNB, Matic, Phantom, and Avalanche. And we can get directly into and back out of, of the BRC20s, already sets, and track. So... We're really excited because apart from this cross-chain bridging, we're also giving users the ability to turn their crypto straight to cash with some virtual debit cards. And we're actually developing physical debit cards that we're expecting to launch next week. We also have a user-friendly wallet in development, and we're working on an on-ramp solution to allow our crypto users to buy directly into BRC20 tokens with fiat. And I'll just wrap it up by saying we also just started a public sale with our revenue share token, which is going to distribute 50% of all utility fees back to holders. And that's going to launch in mid-April. So in short, we're just really dedicated to making the growing Bitcoin blockchain with these BRC20s who want to make it easy and accessible for all crypto users to get in, understand it, and get out when it's time as well. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I have a question for you around, you know, it's like you're, you're building this bridge, you know, it's more infrastructure, you know, obviously this, you know, building on Bitcoin is in its more nascent stages compared to where the rest of the market has gotten to. Obviously there's bridges kind of all over the place. Um, you know, wh why do you think it's important to be building on Bitcoin and, you know, why, you know, if you've got a team and you have the ability to create a startup and get developers and everything, you, can, you technically can go build anywhere. Um, you know, why, why build on Bitcoin and, you know, start the infrastructure side over there? Sure. Well, we think that the BRC20 narrative has the potential to just be huge because Bitcoin itself, I mean, there's no question about it. It's the biggest crypto in the world and likely always will be. So if we have Bitcoin users who may be looking to stay on Bitcoin, but they're interested in, I don't know, getting a little degen, they're going to start looking more and more into ordinals and BRC20s. And so by providing easy ways to get there, 
we're trying to capture that audience. And the, the, the BRC20, like that token standard, you know, I remember when it came out, um, you know, I think it was capped to, to four, uh, like the ticker could only be four letters, right? And then, you know, you did have kind of a bunch of people go and mint out a lot of these. Like I remember in the case, like we were looking at like Lunar, like L-U-N-R for like, you know, Lunar Crush Coin. And we went to go mint it and people are already starting to mint all these things out. And so it kind of felt like people were squatting on like websites early, um, you know, what, like how, like what has changed since then? Like, are you still, are you seeing communities migrating over there? What are people utilizing BRC twenties for right now? And are you seeing, you know, any people that have like established, like, you know, like has, does Chainlink have like their link token minted out on BRC 20? Yeah. I remember when this just exploded and, the network was so congested. People were, are literally just what you said, squatting all over every possible ticker. Um, yeah, it's the way that it's going to change is that the people who are squatting are going to get bought out. And we see that with a lot of chains where people come in early and just start to uh, kind of game the system. So we are seeing some communities taking shape, uh, specifically around Ordi, Sats, and uh, Track, which are the, to the tokens that we are supporting. And we'll continue to add more tokens as uh, the demand comes available. But um, yes, to some of your more specific questions, like is Link taken? I don't know that. If I could jump in and ask, what is, so when you're bridging from Bitcoin to EVMs, I think this is a huge thing, by the way, and it's a big computer science problem to actually solve to do trustlessly. Uh, we should actually talk offline. Uh, Lunar Digital Assets, uh, company I'm CEO for, we're incubating a, a Bitcoin L2 uh, right now called ZKBTC, and that's one of the big computer science problems we're trying to solve. And so I'm wondering, what is the level of decentralization or trustlessness of your bridge? What kind of mechanism are you using? Uh, and, and, you know, we should maybe talk offline about working together. But, yeah, how, how, how decentralized is this or is it fully centralized? What are you doing? Yeah, we'd love to talk more offline. So we're using a proprietary technology and it's all protocol held liquidity. So there's no user risk while using the bridge. Um, it's not 100% trustless. You are trusting us. And the decentralization comes in with, uh, so the way the bridge works, you can do one of two ways. You can either connect your wallet and deposit into a smart contract, or um, if some people, uh, maybe you're familiar with the site changenow.io, you send your assets to an address and then you get assets back out on the other side, whatever you're looking for. So we have these two options, and we're, um, yeah, the, the trustless aspect, you're going you're gonna to trust us. And when you see the way that our product works, and that it works every time with no issues, uh, we've been live in development for six months, live since January, uh, totally flawless, 100% uptime. And uh, yeah, I, I would encourage you guys to come into the Telegram to ask more specific questions if you have any. I think it's good to note to the audience as well, you know, that's no different than every other bridge that's out there. You know, if you're moving from one chain to another, there's, you know, it's just an allotment of time. You know, you will be somewhat centralized for some amount of time at all times. Um, and so there's, there's no difference there. And it's just how quickly can it be? And then, like you said, the timing and the mechanism. So... Well, there are there are some some you know progress being made on this. I mean, you have in Cosmos, IBC is is trustless. You have Polygon CDK uh, with Ag Layer and their LXLY bridge that's trustless between ETH L2s. Uh, you have uh, Optimism Superchain is trying to do this. It's not ready, but maybe in the next year or two. Um, so there are ways to do this. I mean, you can look at. I think Chainlink CCIP has some level of decentralization between chains, and it's not as um, it's not as used yet. But I think that's a big one to watch. Uh, I think you know Jay mentioned that these Bitcoin L twos he was not super bullish on because of centralization factors, and I think that is kind of the case right now. But I think someone's going to solve this. It's a computer science problem. There are things like BitVM, which are using a type of uh, 
optimistic roll-up on top of Bitcoin. There's things like Babylon, which are doing kind of restaking with Bitcoin. So there are definitely some some leads there, maybe drive chains. There, there's a lot of things that may solve this. But as of now, on the Bitcoin side, to go from Bitcoin proof of work to any EVM, they're, they're all basically almost completely centralized. Uh, but I think there's, there's ways to solve that. Actually, there is a, one good one, uh, TBTC, and they've been kind of popping off lately. Uh, that's Threshold. They bridge Bitcoin to EVM using a validator network. So they have 150 or 60 validators, and that validator network validates your Bitcoin coming over. So unlike, you know, BitGo's WBTC, which is completely just custodial centralized, but liquid and seeming reliable, um, TBTC has a validator network. So there are ways to solve this. But yeah, in the current state, most Bitcoin L2s and, and bridges to ETH, etc. are all centralized. Let me uh, quickly point out uh, a few I know of that are really satisfactory uh, and far, as far as decentralization goes. You have IBTC. So what they're doing is a vault system. You have collateral in a vault that automatically pays out if somebody doesn't get their IBTC, which is like a receipt of Bitcoin, of the value in the vault. That's pretty cool. And then um, one that's just coming out that you know, everybody's got to check out. This is called Hyperbridge. It's actually using Polkadot cores as a coprocessor for Ethereum L2s. So instead of having a multi-sig bundling wow. assets between L2s, you actually um, have just Polkadot cores, you know, very decentralized, um, reading, helping the chains read the state, the direct state of each other. So there's no um, no guessing, no no fudging, and no multi-sigs. It's going to be huge. And, uh, What's just the name of that project? That's called Hyperbridge. The token is N-A-N-D. It's just rolling out right now. Just about to go to mainnet soon. Yeah, so a lot of you know, we're a lot of progress being made. I think it's a it's a beautiful future to have atomic swaps working. Um, BRC twenty X, like for people that don't know like BRC twenties yet, and they want to get involved, and like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. I want to be you know participating in this new narrative and building on Bitcoin. Like, how does someone even get started with BRC twenties? Yeah, head over to our website. We're at BRC twenty X io. We have all types of information on what wallets you can get, how to look to get your money started. And, you know, with our cross-chain bridge, if you're in crypto, I mean, you, you can get straight to ordinals now. So head over to our website. Again, it was brc20x.io. We have tons of documentation, and it just we try to make it super easy for people to understand how to get started. Amazing. And then... If we wanted to uh, mint our own new BRC20, could we do that with you guys? Uh, not right now. That's a great question. Maybe that's something we'll have to look into. But in the meantime, ask ChatGPT. <laughs> what do you, BRC, just a uh, last quick question. What do you think about, uh, so my kind of thesis on the way ordinals will go, as gas fees on Bitcoin go up, and they, they will, this is inevitable, um, as you know, as it gets more adoption, gas, you know, mining fees will go up. So I, the way I see this going, and I'd give this like a 80% probability is you mint your ordinals on Bitcoin. So it's immortalized forever on, you know, the Bitcoin proof work blockchain. And then you almost instantly are in the same transaction will bridge them to Bitcoin L2s to be functional layers where you'll be able to do, uh, I'm betting on the EVM ones. Uh, that I have all the tooling already built out. So you'll be able to bridge, get start doing royalties, collateralizing your NFTs or meme coins or whatever, uh, stable coins, uh, be able to put them on DEXs, put them on NFT marketplaces like OpenSea and QuickSwap and Uniswap, all these different things. I think I think the functional layers of ordinals will be these L2s. You will not use Bitcoin L or L1 to trade your ordinals. It just won't be palatable in the coming years. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the use of smart contracts is paramount in DeFi. So, you know, Bitcoin is growing with ordinals and BRC20s, but it's going to have to move to the L2s, like you said. There's just so much more functionality, and that's what people are really looking for, not to mention speed and gas fees.
Can you guys hear me? I think I might have just got rugged. We can hear you now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. I thought I got rugged. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one other thing that you guys do have, I saw, is the the virtual debit cards. And, you know, it seems pretty cool to be able to go from, like, Ordi to, like, Fiat. Like, and I haven't really seen that. You know, it's... And I always wonder why more projects don't have their own debit or credit card. But I do see a lot of the... Um, like prepaid cards, but is this a, is it a prepaid card or is it um, like you can actually spend on like a credit card? Like how does it work? Yeah, so this is right now it's a virtual prepaid card, so you can use it online or with tap to pay. And we are working on a physical card. Well, we would love to get these to be reloadable. Um, right now, it's just a straight prepaid. Spend it, buy another one. But we are working on ways to make it so this is more sustainable. And that's really, you know, that's really based on providers. Love it. Amazing. Well, where do people find you? I know you mentioned the website, but anything else that they can do to uh, start interacting with you guys? Give them a follow, everyone. Yeah, follow us on Twitter. Um, head to the website, brc20x.io. Jump in our Telegram, of course, with any questions. We have the team and the devs are in there uh, pretty much 24 hours a day. So come on over. Ask us your hard questions and um, see how we work. Amazing. Well, great. Thank you for the pitch. Also, everyone, uh, we're going to wait for, uh, I think it's Ben the Dog is going to be coming up here for the last pitch. While we do that, uh, they, you know, Mario did pin the newsletter uh, tweet up there at the top. So if you guys want to all tap on there, join the newsletter. Uh, Mario's doing spaces with some of the biggest people in the world now um you know it's it's not just crypto it's also uh politics geopolitics it's tech it's everything um so make sure you get in there and uh subscribe to that newsletter um it's a it's a really solid one so get in there and tap that um while we wait here brock j i mean drew drew speaking i don't know drew i don't even know if you've if you've hopped in yet if you're there if you've got any comments on what you've heard today yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on Bitcoin overall. I uh, really like the BRC20s and ordinals in general and kind of where things are going for this bull run. So um, I think uh, with the having approaching uh, next month, um, you know, the supply shock that's coming is going to create some interesting dynamics, especially with these ETFs eating up what they are. So, um, yeah, we're excited about all the conversation I've been hearing and, uh, and where things are going. Amazing. What, what are you working on right now? I'm, I'm mainly on Ethereum um, and uh, doing kind of like layer twos. Uh, I'm a Solidity developer, so that's kind of my world. Um, been working on uh, a couple BRC20 tokens, but they're not uh, planned to launch till after the halving. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think I think that token standard uh, is really interesting. Uh, uh, Domo is the creator of that. Um, and um, and with it on Bitcoin, it's um, uh, you just have so much more capital there to throw into projects. So the communities I've been a part of that are BRC twenties and even the ordinal communities, you just get so much higher valuations that you then you get even on Ethereum and and, and of course like Solana and Cardano and some of the other chains. Uh, so uh, interested to see where that is going. Um, Domo. Um, even said that wasn't the BRC 20 standard that he came up with. Isn't it like a permanent or kind of long-term solution on the best way to do fungible tokens on Bitcoin. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how that iteration comes around, uh, you know, and, and where they get, I guess kind of where they land in as, as a long-term solution to fungible tokens on Bitcoin using that ordinal protocol. Is there only one standard there? I know on because now we're seeing doginals, which I actually think, I think Bitcoin ordinals in, in a lot of ways are kind of frothy. I feel similar how I did about NFTs back in you know 2020, 2021. Um, but doginals seem interesting, and they have a couple different standards. Do you know are there are there different standards for Bitcoin yeah. ordinals? Well yeah, it depends on the chain. So Doge Nulls is on the the Doge blockchain, um, and and with um, you know, when you look at like the ordinal side is like the, the on-chain uh, inscriptions, uh, which on Bitcoin are called ordinals, can either be fungible tokens, which are the BRC20s, 
uh, as right now, that's kind of the leading way or, or just like an order as you think of like an NFT, a non fungible token with a picture. So on, and, and they took a very different approach, uh, on Bitcoin by doing it per Satoshi versus on Ethereum, um, the, you can, uh, inscribe text, uh, another call data, uh, and do it. And they're all NFTs. So with, in, with pictures, um, that you've got the inscriptions and then they're also pushing right now on fungible tokens, um, uh, middle March and Hirsch and then that team of developers, uh, that came up with the inscriptions is pushing fungible tokens on Ethereum right now. And they're working on some ways of wrapping, uh, ERC 20 smart contract tokens into inscriptions. Uh, so then that way they're trying to catch up with what Bitcoin's doing. Uh, that Domo, that developer put forward for, for the BRC20 token standard. Uh, so, uh, and then you've got kind of the same thing on other blockchains and even layer twos, like base does their inscriptions differently than mainnet Ethereum inscriptions and differently than Bitcoin. Uh, same thing with Polygon. So there's just a lot of experimentation going on, on that front. Uh, for both the non fungible tokens on that are inscribed on blockchains. And the benefit that you get with all that, uh, is the image or the data is actually on the chain as opposed to like smart contract NFTs, like, you know, in the Ethereum world, ERC 721s or ERC 1155s and some of the other stuff that's been ex experimented with. Um, those are all using a third party system like IPFS, um, to store the images. Um, and so there's a big advantage to having uh, images inscribed on the blockchain, no matter what blockchain you're on, um, you know, as far as non-fungible tokens. Uh, and then what's real exciting is all this experimentation is going on with fungible tokens that are on chain uh, and, and kind of where that's heading. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's, uh, that's kind of my, I guess, answer to that. And it, it's really, I, I'm just really like, you know, as a developer, I geek out and all this type of stuff. It's exciting. That's yeah, the fact that the fact that uh, these these uh, you can have NFTs and they're actually on chain. I, I'm kind of surprised that you know ETH and other NFTs they went away from that because I think in the beginning they were that like Ether Rocks are they just directed to an IPFS server or they or uh, you know CryptoPunks are these directed to some server with a link to the photo and that could go down or are there any ETH in it because you don't need to use like ETH inscriptions necessarily. I don't think, and you, you would know best, Drew, and good to see you, by the way, man. But you, so, like, do you need to do an actual inscription to do that, or couldn't you just put an image on a normal ETH smart contract NFT, an, e, an ERC721 or whatever? Um, I, if I it was small in, enough? Uh, yeah, I have to look into the rocks to see how they did it. Um, the, like, when you look at before there were the smart contract standards for NFTs, like the 721s, uh, so when you look at those early NFTs, they were all still done with smart contracts pointing off chain to an image. So, um, you know, the, the, the punks was the big one, uh, the crypto punks. Uh, and then, and then, and then the kind of next big way, the one that had the game was the crypto kitties. And those led to that ERC 721 standard, uh, for how to, you know, the, the, the foundation approved, uh, for how to do, uh, smart contract, non-fungible tokens. Um, and so, are crypto kitties now, man, they were massive. They literally broke, like not really broke ETH, but basically like made it unusable. And, you know, you see like the, the rocks, they later on, you know, came, made a comeback in 2021 and were valued at like 3 million. Uh, I think I saw an interview I was on and I was quoting that they were at 3 million. So I guess they must have hit that. And then you have, you know, crypto punks took off again. So these older, you know, first generation NFTs, they, they, they usually have a resurgence, but I never saw crypto kitties again. What's up with that? There, there's a few, uh, there's just so many crypto kitties. Uh, there's a few of them that have high valuations and have had some sales, you know, more like the Genesis, um, uh, kind of level the, that kind of top level of that breeding <laughs> infrastructure, that gameplay, uh, that, you know, that still have high valuations. Um, and, um, 
Yeah, it, it just, I think when you look at NFTs from like the last cycle, the ones that hold their value and in my opinion will go up in value this cycle are the ones with really strong communities and the ones that have historical relevance. And I think Yuga has done the best job of acquiring the collections with the most historical relevance, um, you know, as we move forward in the kind of the history of the Ethereum blockchain, they've acquired uh, those, those major collections uh, and the communities behind them uh, and under their umbrella. And, and there's a bunch of other ones that have really strong communities from last cycle that are still thriving um, and are still experimenting with stuff. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's my opinion with, uh, with, um, with non-fungible tokens. And a lot of these you'll see, like even Yuga, they did the ape, um, they did their ape coin, uh, which is a fungible token. Frank D gods and his crew did the dust token, which is their fungible token. Uh, so a lot of these communities, uh, I, I think when you look at a healthy blockchain community, it should be a mix of both a fungible token and a, you know, it's probably a series of non fungible token collection, NFT collections, uh, to kind of create a long, um, a long-term sustainable community and project there that, that's dynamic. Awesome. Well, this has been, this has been great. You guys, um, we're going to wrap it here. Uh, but I appreciate all the speakers and everyone that's come up on stage. This was a fun one. We started with, you know, Bitcoin inflows, outflows. We got into BRC twenties. We got into new layer one. So everyone make sure you give Masa BRC 20 X a follow, check out what they're working on. Really exciting stuff at, you know, all corners of the industry, you can tell the innovation is back. Um, so I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. This has been fun. Until next time, take care, everyone.